Good morning. Good morning. I know you're all as thrilled to be here on Monday morning as I am, but we can do better than that. Yes, please. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So first, um, just a little bit about uh, the music I was playing at the beginning of, the beginning of class. Um, those were reconstructions of ancient Greek pieces for an instrument called the lyre. Um, do any of you know what a lyre is? It's a small handheld part. Yeah. If you see like the, uh, you know, the old uh, Greek vase paintings that you often have poet figures holding this little harp, it looks kind of like this. That's a lyre. And this was the instrument that Greek poets plucked or strummed as they recited. Um, all Greek poetry, lyric or epic, actually it's from the lyre that we get the word lyric poetry. Um, lyric or epic, it was meant to be accompanied by music. So the poem that you read last week, the poem that you were reading for today, Try to imagine what this would sound like if someone were singing or chanting it, right? Because that's the way it would have been received by its original audiences. Um, okay, so that out of the way. Uh, who has questions? Yeah, secret. Um, I noticed in Dorian uh, poem they had like little inspirers. Uh huh. Italicized. Okay. Mm -hmm. What exactly? Can you take us to an example and read it for us? Um, on page 244. Okay. And this um, goes by Art Artemis sometimes mm -hmm. owns the mountains. Mm -hmm. um, immense packages or huge monsters. Close enough. Sharing arrows of hunt, boars, or fleets, antelope. And with her play, the daughters of Zeus, who range the wild woods, and Leto is glad that her daughter towers above them all with her shining crow, though they are beautiful. So the unwed princess among her attendants. Yeah, so what, what you've seen here, what, what you're pointing to is an example of what's called an epic simile. <coughs> and this is something that is, um, you don't find it in older epics like Gilgamesh. Um, this is something that the Greeks introduce into the epic form. And the epic simile uh, sort of takes you out of the action for a moment and compares some individual object event in the text, in the narrative, to something important outside of it. Right? So. You uh, may have noticed when we're looking at the Iliad, right? There were a couple of moments where they talk about, like, you know, Achilles, you know, like an eagle waiting to dive bomb a sparrow or something like that, right? It's the same sort of thing. Um, you compare the character to something in nature or something else in the world. So, what is being compared to what here in this particular instance? Who's the subject of the simile? Yeah, right, the princess, Nausicaa. <coughs> and let's try to pick the simile apart. Who's Artemis? She's Paul's sister. Yep, yeah, okay, yeah, Artemis is, yes, she is all of these things. She is Apollo's twin sister. She is the goddess of the hunts. What else is she associated with? Pardon? Um, you're thinking of Athena, yeah. Although she, has, uh, Artemis does have one thing in common with Athena. Do either are either of these goddesses paired with male consorts? No. No. Yeah, they are both virgin goddesses. She's the goddess of the hunt. Yes. Uh, as well as fertility, um, 
she has her own bow, but she's also known for the deer. The, doesn't she keep a consort with a deer or something? She, she turns Not, a male into she, a deer, he, comes and looks at her. And, yeah, because he, 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 he spied on her when she was bathing, and so she turns him into a deer, and he's torn apart by his own hounds. Yeah, um, so that's not so much a consort sort of situation. It's more an anti-consort sort of situation. To yeah, yeah, that yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I, um, that may not be the that may not be the relevant myth here. Um, but yeah, I just remember that because yeah. I studied it in high school. Yep. But yeah, she yeah she does it. She um, she is associated with assisting women in childbirth. But she yeah she is herself a virgin goddess, right? So, what characteristics of Artemis are we meant to see then in Nausicaa? Um, yeah, no husband, no cares yet, right? No real responsibilities, kind of wild and at play with her female attendants on the seashore, right? So yeah, that's, that's the way these epic similes tend to work. Right? It's drawing, uh, drawing attention to some characteristic or drawing out some characteristic of the characters. Um, other questions? Yeah, keep going. Okay. <laughs> it's not necessarily a question. I uh -huh. just want to make sure I'm going to write Sure. On um, page 257, when, um, uh huh. Odysseus was going back into the town, and Athena had made him stronger and godlike. Uh huh. At first, with his shoulders all big and strong, and everybody yeah. thought he was supposed to be magnificent. Is this supposed to illustrate how the townsmen view other people, or? Well, let, let's let's think about what Odysseus's condition is when he washes up on the shore of this island, right? This is a guy who's been wandering for a decade. You know, he, he, after a war, um, he's been trapped for some time, when we see him here, on the island of a sea nymph named Calypso. And she's finally been told by the gods that she has to let him go. So, first thing that happens to him he gets out in his little raft, and he gets shipwrecked on this other island, right? So he's dirty, right? He's aging. He probably doesn't look so good as he's coming into this particular town. So to make the people more willing to help him, Athena sort of increases his glamour, right? Now, what does this indicate here about relationships between human beings and the gods? Why does Athena care so much? Yeah, she favors Odysseus. She likes this guy. He's one of her favorite humans. Do all of the gods favor Odysseus? Poseidon wants him dead. Yeah. So we see here that the gods are not united in their councils, right? And will sometimes work <laughs> at cross purposes to each, uh, to each other, right? So Athena is trying to get Odysseus home, to help Odysseus get home, right? The whole point of this epic, uh, the Greek word for it would be, uh, it's a tale of uh, nostos, which means homecoming or return. Now, this will probably be more important uh, next time. But does anybody know anything about uh, how the Greeks believed fate worked? Yeah. Exactly. These three goddesses, they were called the, you know, the fates of the moire. Mm -hmm. You had Clotho, who spun out the thread, her sister Lachesis, who measured it, and the third sister, Atropos, who cut it at the end. Right? And the thread rep was representative of an individual human life. Now, how powerful are these goddesses? 
Well, they control life and death. Yeah. And when they've decided what's going to happen to someone, is there anything that that person or anyone else can do about it? Not really. Yeah. The conditions under which it happens can be changed. But what's going to happen to you is what's going to happen to you, right? Regardless of what anyone else tries to do, human or God. So if Odysseus is fated to get home, can Poseidon actually stop him? No, merely delay. No, yeah, he can, but he can make him absolutely friggin' miserable along the way, right? So destiny, fate for the Greeks, these things are inexorable. There's nothing you can do to stop it. But the way in which it comes about um, is often unpredictable. Um, and I, how, many, how many of you are familiar with, uh, let's say, uh, the story of Oedipus, right? It's essentially a myth about trying to avoid your fate and trying to avoid it, inadvertently bringing it about, yeah. All right, so other questions you guys have about this? Anything you really want to talk about? Yeah, Stephanie. I didn't really understand why he like, would never tell them his name. Like, they asked, uh -huh. he would, like, he would just go off and, like, not tell Yeah, he's incognito here, right? Yeah. Well, if he just said, I'm Odysseus, they'd probably have clumped him to death with his body. <laughs> yeah, um, th th there, there are, um, it'll, it'll become more clear when we read Book 9 why he's reluctant to give out his name. But there are a couple of things I'll say about this right now. For one thing, One possible translation of the name Odysseus is trouble. And Odysseus, well, what do you know about Odysseus as a figure in mythology? What kind of person is he? What's he known for? Oh, being a great technician. Okay. For strat strategy, yeah, he is the, the epithet that's most often attached to him in this epic in the Iliad in Greek is <coughs> Polymetis. Right? Many thoughts, many strategies. So, are we talking about a thinking hero or a punching hero? Thinking hero, yes, yes. Not so much like Achilles, not so much like Gilgamesh. Right? Odysseus primarily lives by his wits. And what does that mean he often has to do in order to survive, in order to, in order to prevail? Trick people and I'll them. Yeah. He's a trickster hero. He gets his way largely through deception. So part of the reason he's concealing his identity is because trickery is just part of who he is. It's just part of his nature. But what else do we know him to be responsible for that comes up at the Phaeacian court in the Bard story? Yeah, he's the guy who came up with the idea for the Trojan horse, right? He didn't build it, but he came up with the idea. And he's the guy who led the warriors who waited within the horse as it was dragged into the walls. And then he led the raiding party that slaughtered all of the Trojans, right? So not all of um, Odysseus's stratagems would endear him to all people, right? Burned down an entire city. Yeah. So, you know, does he know where the hell he is? No, in fact, this island, Scaria, more on that minute, <laughs> seems to be 
pretty much, it's not a real place, for one thing. Um, and it seems to be pretty much removed from the rest of the world. So he doesn't know how these people would feel about what he did at Troy, right? So it's probably in his best interest to wait until he's had a chance to feel them out before he reveals who he is. But yeah, there is also an event, as we'll see next time in Book 9, that makes him very, very careful about giving out his name to people. Yeah, Jelen. So, on page 249, uh -huh. Uh-huh. Uh, she's just trying to get him into the Phaeacian court with as little trouble as possible. Right? Um, she just wants to make sure that nobody bothers him along the way. Yeah, well, do there, ha do there actually seem to be any beggars or thieves in this place? This is kind of a paradise island, right? This is a nice place. What's that? Or at least not to be noticed until she could, you know, show him off to advantage once he's in the city. Now, we see him being sort of sneaky and wily and thoughtful when he's first discovered by the princess as well, right? If we look on page 244, he hears the noises of the girls at play on the beach, and he wakes up. What kind of land have I come to now? Are the natives wild and lawless savages, or God-fearing men who welcome strangers? That sounded like girls screaming, or the cry of the spirit woman who hold the high peaks the river wells and the grassy meadows. Can it be I am close to human voices? I'll go and have a look for myself. So what are the two possibilities here? Either. What could he be hearing? A um, woman screaming in terror or just playing. Sirens? Is he talking about sirens? Or something like sirens, right? So it's like, am I on an island that is populated by human beings like myself? Or am I, am I on another island of spirits or monsters? Right. Scaria is the first place where Odysseus has encountered other human beings in years. And if all he can do is hear their voices, right? he doesn't know what's out there yet. He doesn't know what they are. With that, Odysseus emerged from the bushes. He broke off a leafy branch from the undergrowth and held it before him to cover himself, right? I mean, this is almost kind of funny, right? Here's this grizzled old war, you know, sea captain lying naked in the bushes, and he hears these girls screaming, and he's like, okay, well, better go see what that is. Oh, better break off a branch and, and stand up, cover yourself, and hey, how's it going? Where am I? A weathered mountain lion steps into a clearing, confident in his strength, eyes glowing. The wind and rain have let up, and he's hunting cattle, sheep, or wild deer, but is hungry enough to jump the stone walls of the animal pens. So you have another one of those epic similes here. Right? Now, what is Odysseus being compared to here and why? Yeah, he's being compared to a lion, a weathered mountain lion. And what else? What's the point of the comparison? He's desperate. Yeah. So he's, he's hungry enough to do something stupid, right? Confident enough in his strength that he will get through. So Odysseus advanced upon these ringleted girls, naked as he was. What choice did he have? He was a frightening sight, disfigured with brine, and the girls fluttered off to the jutting beaches. Only Alcinous' daughter stayed. Athena put courage in her heart and stopped her trembling. She held her ground, and Odysseus wondered how to approach this beautiful girl. Should he fall at her knees or keep his distance and ask her with honeyed words to show him the way to the city and give him some clothes? He thought it over and decided it was better to keep his distance and not take the chance of offending the girl by touching her knees. So he started this soft and winning speech. So 
what would kneeling before her and touching her knees, what is that? Submissive. Yeah, what, what, what specifically does that gesture mean, if we think back to last time with Priam and Achilles? Um, the gesture yeah. Yeah, that's the right, the suppliant's position. Right. You fall to the ground and hug somebody around the knees. If they're a man, you touch the beard. And that means I am begging for your help, right? I am putting myself in your power and asking for your help. Now, he decides not to do that here. Why not? <laughs> okay, on the one hand, yeah. Is the, yeah, this, this creepy old naked prowler in the bushes, um, right? He might frighten her. This was also a culturally specific gesture. This was a specifically Greek gesture. So if this girl is not Greek or does not follow Greek customs, she's not going to recognize what he's doing. She's not going to understand it. Right, and that's a big part of what's going on in the epic as a whole, is, right, is this distinction between the civilized savage. Um, the Greeks tended to view anyone who was not Greek or who did not follow Greek customs as savage. Right? If you didn't act like a Greek, if you didn't speak Greek, if you didn't dress like a Greek, follow Greek customs, you were a barbarian. A different definition of the word. If you don't speak Greek, you're a barbarian. Well, it, it, essentially, yeah, that's where the word comes from. Um, um, every other, everyone else that the Greeks heard, it sounded like they were saying bar, 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 bar. Well, that was how the Greeks used to make fun of them. Yeah, they would hear somebody speaking non-Greek, and they'd imitate it by saying bar, 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 bar. Um, so that's where we get the word barbarian. Um, so, yeah, essentially someone who can't talk. Um, but yeah, so where was I going with this? Right, so he doesn't know if this girl is a Greek or a barbarian, right? So, on the one hand, he doesn't want to scare her away because even if she is a barbarian, she might still help him. He also doesn't want to put himself in her power. Right? If you make this gesture, you are putting yourself in the other person's power. Right? You're essentially throwing yourself on their mercy. And if he avoids doing that, then he's still sort of negotiating with her from a position of strength. Right? I may just be a creepy old naked guy in the bushes, but I don't have to throw my, I beg for your charity. Even though he kind of does. So what are these people? Are they civilized or are they savage? Okay, what's the evidence we have that they are civilized? Mm -hmm. Yeah, on the one hand, yeah, they, on the one hand, they do help him, right? They help him. That's one of the definitions. Yeah, he does kneel down when he gets to the palace. He makes the gesture there and they get it. They understand it. So that is one hint that these people are in fact civilized. What else suggests that these are civilized people? What sorts of things does he see as he walks to the town? Yeah, there's this, this beautifully crafted palace, right? If you look on page 251, 
Odysseus went to the glorious palace of Alcinous. The fact that they have a city centered around a palace itself would indicate a level, you know, a level of civilization, right? This was how most ancient Mediterranean city-states were organized. You had a central palace where, from which everything was administrated, and then the city just kind of grew up around that. There he stood, heart pounding as he took it all in, before crossing the bronze threshold. So they have a palace, they know how to work bronze. Gleams as of the sun or the moon played over the high roof of Alcinous' house. The bronze walls, surmounted with a blue enamel frieze, stretched from the threshold to the inner hall. The outer doors were golden, and silver doorposts were set in the bronze threshold. The lintel was silver and the door handle gold. Flanking the door were two gold and silver dogs made by Hephaestus with all his art to guard the palace, and they were immortal and ageless. So recognition of art? Yeah, these people practice arts and craftsmanship, right? Really, really good craftsmanship. <coughs> they even have magic guard dogs that were made by one of the gods. So good for them. Inside, seats were built flush to the walls on either side, stretching from the threshold to the inner hall. And upon them were flung robes of a fine, soft weave, the craft of women. The Phaeacian leaders would sit on these seats, eating and drinking, and they lacked for nothing. Golden statues of young men stood on pedestals, holding torches to light the night for banqueters. There were 50 slave women scattered through the house, some grinding yellow grain on the millstone, others weaving cloth or twirling yarn on spindles. As they sat, fluttering like so many leaves on a poplar, and the finely woven fabric glistened with oil. For just as the Phaeacian men outstrip all others in sailing ships on the sea, so too are the women skilled above all others in working the loom. Athena has given them a deep understanding of beautiful handiwork. So, weaving, sailing. The oil seems to be a big um, theme within it too, because they constantly mention oil from the time we hear about Nausicaa. It was like a really big luxury product, isn't it? So if they have a lot of it, it's just... It is, yeah, yeah. O oil is something, yeah, it was mostly used for anointing the body, right? Um, basically, uh, rich people like to walk around looking like they were very, very bronzed up. So they would rub themselves with olive oil. And it, well, yeah, it was a luxury product. So the fact that they have that indicates wealth. The gold and the silver indicates wealth. And they also have... A home, the, the, the palace is organized around a hearth where the queen, Arete, holds court. Now, <clears throat> what this indicates, there's a, you know, a separate space in the palace for male and for female activities. Right? The men have their, count, their public council chamber and inside, the women do various kinds of domestic work, and the female head of household sits by a hearth. This is a very, very specific construct called an oikos. Now, we know this word in reference to a virtually unswallowable brand of Greek yogurt. <laughs> yes, pre the, yes, preferred by TV's John Stamos, apparently. Probably because he was about the uh, he was the, the only Greek American celebrity who wasn't doing anything when they asked him to do the commercial. So, what oikos actually means is household. And to the Greeks, this is one means of testing whether or not people are civilized. Right? Do they organize their household in a pro in the proper way? Are the public areas in the front of the house, places where men's work goes on? Are the private areas in the back of the house, places where women's work goes on? Is there a hearth at the middle? Right. In a Greek family, basically the man was the public face of the family, and the women by and large stayed at home, were meant to remain inside. So the Phaeacians have an oikos, they have a palace culture, they sail, 
they're rich, they practice all these other arts and crafts, and what else do they, what do they do to entertain Odysseus while he's there? Nice yeah. They play all of the civilized sports. Boxing, wrestling, discus throwing, javelin throwing, running. Now what would be the purpose of these sports? Why did the Greeks emphasize these particular sports? I'm sorry, I'm sorry um, one at a time. <laughs> Go ahead. Because that was the best ones that they could do. Like, that was what they were best at. Well, the, the, that's why the Phaeacians, do the, they're showing off what they're, the dancing is the thing they're actually best at, right? So they make sure they show that off. What were you going to say, Secret? So that the Phaeacians can go back and tell others how great they are and what uh -huh. they're good at and just yeah. close about them. Well, the, yeah, th this would be the reasons why they show him, right? But why, why were these sports important to the Greeks? I guess I think it's like it's kind of like a story or something. Like, it's kind of like, a, like, a, like when they sing and stuff, they're like feeling on the we'll get to the We'll get to the song in a minute. Who's this? Isn't it a test of strength to see it? To, to an extent, right? For but if, if, honor if, and glory, I thought of warfare, correct? For honor and glory outside of warfare, right? But what we're, we're getting on the right track here now, right? What do these sports sort of resemble? What what are these skills you need for? War. Yeah, exactly. Athletic competition for the Greeks was largely about military preparedness, right? So yeah, the early Olympics, you know, the ancient Greek Olympics uh, were really. It was a way of show, it was a, a form of kind of proxy warfare, right? It was sort of showing off really which city state had the best warriors without shedding any blood, right? Javelin throwing, discus throwing, running, boxing, wrestling. These are all, yeah, these are all skills a warrior would have needed. So, <clears throat> anything weird about that? In terms of the Phaeacians? Yeah, who the hell are they going to fight? Right? <laughs> <laughs> why, why would they need military preparedness? Maybe they just wanted him to know how it works, so in case he gets back and brings people you know, they mm -hmm. back or something. Yeah, well, what's, what's the likelihood that he could actually bring people back here, though? Well, not without the sign destroying him. <laughs> yeah. No. This, this specific one is protected by Poseidon. Yeah, this is one of those magic kingdoms that no one can really get to on purpose. And, you know, we're, we're at, we're going to see a lot of... Yeah. We're going to see a lot of places Odysseus visits that are described as being at the end or the edge of the world. This is one of those places. This is one of those edge of the world places. All right, we get a reference at the very beginning of book six here to its inaccessibility, right? On page 242. So Odysseus slept, the godlike survivor, overwhelmed with fatigue. But the goddess Athena went off to the land of the Phaeacians, a people who had once lived in Hyperia, near to the Cyclopes, a race of savages who marauded their land constantly. One day, great Nausithus led his people off to Scaria, a remote island where he walled off a city, built houses and shrines, and parceled out fields. So, two important things that Nausithus does in this passage. What does he do? Leads his people away from the Cyclopses. Okay, leads his people away from the Cyclopses and... Builds a city. Builds a city that is walled off, right? He removes his people from the world. And then does what else? If he's out the spoils? Well, it's not so much spoils, right? Land. Yeah, land, building activity, right? So first, we come over here and we isolate ourselves. And then we civilize everything, right? We build houses, we build shrines, we build fields. 
This is going to be one of the big distinctions Odysseus is going to use in the subsequent books to determine what sort of place he's in, right? Do I see cultivated fields here? Do I see shrines and houses? If I don't, this place is probably going to be dangerous. This place is probably not settled by regular human beings. Right, we'll get in particular next time to a distinction um, between farming and herding that actually reverses the distinction we talked about when we looked at the Cain and Abel story. Right, how did the, uh, how did the ancient Israelites seem to feel about herding versus farming? Herding was the thing to do. Yep, herding good, farming bad. The Greeks tend to think in the opposite way, right? Farming good, farming requires tools and civilization and social organization. Herding bad, barbarians can do it. So yeah, farms for Odysseus are gonna be a sign of civilization. He's gonna feel more like, it's more likely he can trust people in places where he sees farmed fields. All right, so what other questions do you guys have about this? Yeah, secret. Yeah, keep going. It's good, it's good you have so many questions. Uh huh. Okay. Yes. Yes, it is. You're talking about the, the, the song in which he, uh, in, right, in which um, Hephaestus captures Ares and Aphrodite in their lovemaking. Yes, that is actually important. Um, does anybody know what? How many of you are familiar with the Odyssey on some level already? Okay, most of you. How many of you have ever, have ever actually read the whole thing? Anybody? Okay, good. That's a couple of you. Anybody seen a movie? All right. Most of you have seen a movie. All right. <laughs> no, no, you're not reading the Odyssey. Just watch this movie and then we're taking the test. God. That's the, the, the state. The state of American education. All right. Okay. I don't know. So, what is going on in Odysseus's home while he's away? His wife, um, the land is trying to get the wife to marry somebody new. And yeah. Because they assume that Odysseus is dead. Yeah, it's exactly. It's been like 20 years. Yeah, it's been a long time. Yeah, it, right. Odysseus is the king of the island of Ithaca, and his palace is overrun with these suitors. Who are not completely without cause trying to press Odysseus's wife Penelope to marry one of them, right? I mean, Odysseus has been gone a ridiculously long time. Everybody thinks he's dead, right? So waiting around, you know, waiting around in that palace by herself seems absurd, right? Someone should get to enjoy Odysseus' estate, right? Not his nearly adult son. Get that little bastard out of the way. So essentially, Odysseus' palace has been overrun with an infestation of assholes who are drinking his wine, eating his sheep, disrespecting his son, and trying to sleep with his wife. So what's Odysseus going to do at the end of the epic? I killed him. Yes. He's going to kill them all. <laughs> <laughs> but how, how is he going to, how is he first going to accomplish this? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, everyone needs yep. to kill them in one location and yeah. trap them. Exactly, yeah. He traps them with a clever strategy, right? So let's look at this story about Aphrodite and Ares, right? So what's the situation 
here? What three characters are primarily involved? And how are they related to each other? Okay, yeah. Hephaestus. And what's his role in all of this? Yeah, he's Aphrodite's husband. And Aphrodite and Ares are dallying in his house, right? In his bed. And so he sets up this net to capture them in the act and pretends he's going out of town. And then when he comes back, there they are, trapped. Does this sound a little bit like <coughs> Odysseus's situation? Right? Yeah, they, they, these guys in his house trying to sleep with his wife while he's gone. So the primary difference here, though, is in how the story about Aphrodite and Ares ends. What happens to Aphrodite and Ares? Pardon? Yeah, they run away, right? They escape. Page 266. And with that, the strong smith undid the bonds, and the two of them, free at last from their crimp, shot out of there, Ares to Thrace, and Aphrodite, who loves laughter and smiles, to Paphos on Cyprus, and her precinct there with its smoking altar. There the graces bathed her and rubbed her with the ambrosial oil that glistens on the skin of the immortal gods, and then they dressed her in beautiful clothes, a wonder to see. Does this sound like anything we've seen before? Uh-huh. When they bathe and when she bathe them and then clone Yep, and then yes, you are handsome in keto, you were like a god and all that, right? But I think there's actually a closer analog in something we've read more recently. What sort of thing does Homer like to do when he's setting up these parallel situations between the mortals and the between mortals and gods? The gods always end with this sort of joyful experience. I don't say joyful. Uh -huh. they, they, There's no reward they, for Like it ended with a party or mm -hmm. ended with talk or ended with, you know, let's get back to being happy and doing what we do and not worry yeah. about it. Yeah. world by fighting each other. Ex yeah. For the gods, ultimately, there are never any consequences. Right. They're immortal. They can't really be hurt. Time doesn't mean anything to them. So, yeah. Even when they're caught and humiliated like this, they just go back to doing pleasant God things, right? Essentially, luxuriating about and savoring the smoke of the sacrifices. Once in a while, yeah. But yeah, there's, there's no need for any real consequence or punishment here, right? Now, when Odysseus gets his hands on the suitors, it's going to be quite different, right? It is going to be wholesale slaughter, even of, the one, even of the ones who weren't really all that bad. And then a complete purging of his household, right? Not just the suitors, but anybody, any of his servants who collaborated with them. Takes them all out. Completely cleans house. So we have a sort of analog here, a sort of parallel story that emphasizes how pleasant life is for the gods. And in doing so, draws out that, you know, that comparison, you know, just how, just how dirty and difficult and nasty life often is for mortals who don't have the same benefits. So, 
to get to the author of this piece and a little bit of the cultural context. Can anybody tell me how much historians or literary scholars know for certain about Homer? Very little, if I'm not mistaken. Didn't he like, uh, come from like, the dark age of literacy in Greece? Uh, we think so. Um, and really, like, kind of the best way we can answer any question about Homer is, uh, yeah, maybe, or no, probably not, right? It's really kind of fuzzy. We don't even know that there was any such poet. We do think that the poems that are attributed to him, right, the Iliad, the Odyssey, and a set of sort of uh, praise poems to the gods called the Homeric hymns, were written by the same person. But we know very little, okay, well basically we know nothing for sure, about who that person was. What is the tradition that is often attached to the character of Homer? A lot of people think he was blind. Yeah, a lot of people think he was a, that he was a blind poet. Um, we have no real basis for that belief. The only, um, the only thing that people sort of surmise happened there is that because the poet Demodocus in the Odyssey is blind, that you know, this was some sort of self-portrait that Homer was inserting into the poem. Um, we have no other basis for believing that Homer was blind. Um, we can pretty much tell by the sort of the state of the language Homer writes in that it was sometime in the 8th of the 7th century BC. So what we're looking at in the Iliad and the Odyssey is what we would think of as classical Greek civilization in a very, very early stage, right? This particular period is usually referred to as the Archaic period. Which is then followed by, you know, the glory that is classical Athens, um, and then followed by obscurity. Yay, obscurity. But at the time this poem is produced, we think, Greece is coming out of a very long dark age in which writing was lost, culture was lost, um, all sorts of things were lost. Now, Odysseus and other heroes of Greek myth would have been um, as I think we talked about last time, right? Not what we would think of as Greeks, but they're Minoans and Mycenaeans. They're members of these two ancestor civilizations that were wiped out in this sort of Mediterranean-wide cataclysm around the year 1000 BCE. What seems to have happened there um, are a series of invasions of pirates, really, um, just hordes and hordes of pirates uh, swarming most of the major civilizations at the time, um, Phoenicia, the Hittites, Egypt, the Mycenaeans, the Minoans, all of them. Where did they come from? Uh, well, no one really knows. Uh, that is one of the great mysteries of ancient history. So just suddenly pirates? Yeah, um, <laughs> basically, yeah. <laughs> I mean, we, we know that this happened because uh, the Egyptians in particular refer to these sea peoples in their records, and they give names to various uh, of their tribes. In fact, uh, when, we talked in, when we were talking about the book of Genesis, we talked about 
those uh, 12 tribes of Israel, right, named for the sons of Jacob. Um, and there were those tribes who were the sons of the handmaidens, who historians now think were not original members of the confederation. Some of the names of these tribes of sea peoples are actually very similar to the names of uh, some of those tribes of Israel. Are the translations similar? Is that why they have been concluded to be, I don't know, concluded to be the same or concluded to be similar? Is it because they translate the very similar names? Or? Well, I mean, it, it, it's just the, the, the names in the Egyptian text sound very much like the names okay, that are so given to those. Names out loud, yeah, yeah. So are these sea people what we consider Vikings or is this Oh no, no. Vi Vikings are Vikings are yeah, much, much later. Okay. Yeah. No, the, the the I think the prevailing theory about who these sea peoples were is that they were um, essentially they were out of work mercenaries. Who um yeah, took 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 to raiding during a prolonged period of peace. That's what happens. Yeah. That's what happened in the golden age of piracy. Yeah. But uh, yeah. Anyway, so what we yeah what we have in the eighth to seventh centuries BC is a sort of emerging out of this period, sort of rediscovery of language, rediscovery well rediscovery of writing anyway of written language, and we think that just about the first things that were written in Greek scripts were the Iliad and the Odyssey. The only other thing we think we know about Homer, and I believe I mentioned this last time, uh, but it sort of bears repeating as we continue to look at the Odyssey, they think he was from the very eastern edge of the Greek world, so from like what's now western Turkey because he seems to know the geography around Troy really, really, really well. Um, so well, in fact, that 19th century German archaeologists were able to locate what they think is the site of Troy based solely on clues in the Iliad. But then when we get to the Odyssey and we leave, like once we leave the eastern edge of the Mediterranean, it seems that he suddenly has no idea where the hell he is, um, or where other, other nations are in relation to each other, or things of that nature. So we do think that these poems were written by the same person. Uh, similar style, similar themes, uh, a lot of uh, uh, language use that repeats. Um, but yeah, we do think that yeah, once this person left Turkish waters, um, he had no idea where he was anymore, had no idea what he was talking about. And really, when it comes down to the Odyssey, it doesn't matter because most of it takes place in a sort of magical never-never land anyway. Right? Most of the islands that Odysseus visits are not real places. Scaria, for example, is not a real place. There is an island of Ithaca, but it's not where um, Homer says it was. Okay, where are we for time, by the way? How are we doing? 1023. Okay. Yeah, I never had uh, the lack of a clock in this room. It is, uh... Yes. What's that? Oh, um. I hope so. <laughs> they haven't fixed this one yet. Um, yeah, I imagine it's probably a new screen on the floor, yeah. All right, so. Other questions you guys have about this? Anything else that you want to know about this, that you want to talk about? Anything else that confused you or interested you? Okay. Yeah, go ahead. One last question. All um, right. When the first Poet poem or fall at the first piece and Odysseus was crying. Uh-huh. Is it because of that you're reminding him of explosion and reason and now he lost all his men? Well not lost his men, but why does he really cry? Does it bring back memories of the death of his soldier? Yeah, that's that, that's that's actually a really good question. Let's let's see if we can T 
tease something out of what I like. Are you talking about page 259? All right, so uh, can you actually read that for us starting around uh, line 79 with the muse? Prophesied. Prophesied. Mm -hmm. that this would happen. That was in the days when the great tide of war was rolling in upon Trojans and Greece alike through the will of great Zeus. This was the song. The renewed bard sang, but Odysseus pulled his great purple cloak over his head and hid his handsome face. He was ashamed to let the patient scenes see his tears falling down. Never okay. All right. Okay, so he hears this particular story, starts crying, covers his face in shame. So let's look first at the, at the story itself. What's the story that he's hearing? Okay, yeah, so it's a story of the Trojan War. So what should that indicate to him, for one thing? When he left home. Yeah, the, the, this is what, but like what, what news of events in the outside world does this impart to him? It's become this story, it's become a legend, it's sung. Yeah, that even in this remote corner of the world that no one can get to, people know about the Trojan War and people know the name of Odysseus, right? So on the one hand, this is, a, this is a bit of a warning to him. These people know who Odysseus is. He has not yet revealed to them his identity. And it's the quarrel Odysseus once had with Achilles. So Odysseus and Achilles are quarreling. And who's looking on and smiling? Now, what do we remember about Agamemnon's role in the Greek army in the Iliad? Yeah, he's the overarching commander, right? He is the overarching general. So why would he be excited, why would he be happy to see two of his best men arguing with each other? It keeps them from trying to usurp some authority from him. On the one, yeah, it keeps either, it keeps both of their eyes on each other and not on him, so it helps him maintain his authority. And what else is specifically referenced here? Why else is he happy about this? Yeah, the oracle said this would happen. Right, so this is one of the sort of magic signs that he's looking for in his path to victory in Troy, right? Aha, this is one of the things that was supposed to happen. We're getting close now. Right, remember, you know, that whole, that, that belief in fate, right? But that still doesn't necessarily explain why he's so damn, like why Odysseus is so damn upset about this, right? Why does he cover his face and cry when the Phaeacians tell this story? To me, it just sounds like he's crying because it's a reminder of all that he's lost. Okay. Yeah, crying is also a shame. 
considered a weakness. You, you think he feels guilty about his role in the war. Okay. And you think he's ashamed to show tears. I think it's a mixture of all of it. Um, Go ahead. Maybe he's ashamed of his uh, quarrel with Achilles because Achilles is dead. Yeah. yeah. That could be. His right. role in the death of Achilles, too. Well, how, how was Odysseus involved in Achilles' death? Because of the quarrel. But that's, this isn't what kills Achilles. Oh. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, well, and, you know, one would argue fate kills Achilles. He dies in the way he was supposed to. But, yeah, I, I think, um, I think you're actually on to something, Sarah. Do you have evidence in the poem that suggests that what Odysseus is ashamed of is his role in the war? Or is it just, or is it just a hunch? I was just thinking, it was a hunch. Okay. I was just taking it from how I read this. Like he was just going to be out of the war. Still wearing a thing. Whatever you think, all of us thought that. He poured meditations to the doctors. Yeah, he's pouring right li libations. Does anybody know what that means? Pouring libations. Portions. Well, yeah. It, well, essentially, I mean, it's it's not it's not unlike the gesture of you know pouring one out for your dead homies, right? It's <laughs> essentially the same thing, right? It's a, what you're doing, like what he's doing is making a certain kind of what's called a chthonic sacrifice, right? If you want to feed the gods in the sky, you burn something on an altar and the smoke goes up to them, right? If you want to feed the gods in the ground, you pour things on the ground. So the idea, the fact that he's pouring out wine onto the ground while they're talking about his dead friends suggests what? Pouring wine to his friends. Yeah, he's pouring out wine to the dead. He is sharing his cup, he's sharing his drink with the dead. He's going to make a more, um, a more graphic kind of chthonic sacrifice in Book 11. But, um, yeah, this is an example of, of that sort of thing. That's what, he, that's what he's doing, basically. Could that be the evidence that his sharing is his shame of... of Survivor's yeah, he, he's, he's one of the last Greek heroes left. He's one of the only Greek heroes who is going to make it home and if survive. All died, many of his friends you mm -hmm. know, who fought the war were dead, so maybe he has survivor's guilt. Okay, yeah, there could be survivor's guilt here. He couldn't save everyone, despite how smart he was. One could argue when we look at when we we'll see when we look at books nine through nine through eleven that he doesn't he doesn't always really try all that hard um, to save everyone, um, but uh, let's look at the portion about the Trojan horse. Page two sixty nine. Odysseus specifically asks Demodocus to play this story, right, to sing this song. So he spoke, and the, god, and the bard, moved by the god, began to sing. Remember, like, the, the ancient Greeks believed that poets and reciters of poetry were actually possessed by a muse. He made them see it happen, how the Greeks set fire to their huts on the beach and were sailing away, while Odysseus and the picked men with him sat in the horse, which the Trojans had dragged into their city. There the horse stood, and the Trojans sat around it, and could not decide what they should do. There were three ways of thinking. Hack open the timbers with pitiless bronze, or throw it from the heights to the rocks below, or let it stand as an offering to appease the gods. The last was what would happen, for it was fated that the city would perish once it enclosed the great wooden horse, in which now sat the Greek heroes who would spill Troy's blood. The song went on. The Greeks poured out of their hollow ambush and sacked the city. 
He sang how one hero and another there ravaged tall Troy, but how Odysseus went, like the war god himself, with Menelaus to the house of Deiphobus. And there, he said, Odysseus fought his most daring battle and won with the help of Pallas Athena. This was his song, and Odysseus wept. Tears welled up in his eyes and flowed down his cheeks. A woman wails as she throws herself upon her husband's body. He has fallen in battle before the town walls, fighting to the last to, de to defend his city and protect his children. As she sees him dying and gasping for breath, she clings to him and shrieks, while behind her soldiers prod their spears into her shoulders and back, and as they lead her away into slavery, her tear-drenched face is a mask of pain. So too Odysseus, pitiful in his grief. So what do we have here in this italicized passage? What do we call these? We have another one of these epic similes, exactly. And what is Odysseus being compared to here? Um, a woman whose husband has just died and being, is being led away. Yeah, a woman who is, whose husband has just been killed by Greek soldiers sacking the city and who is being dragged away into slavery by her captors. So why, at this point, does the epic compare Odysseus to this. <clears throat> Why is Odysseus's weeping like this kind of weeping? The, yeah, I, I, I think I think there's certainly something to that, right? I mean, it, it is. A really interesting reversal here. It's like in the in Demodocus's tale, Odysseus is running around doing the slaughtering, but then in the simile, he's identified with the victims. And this is actually one thing to note about the character of Odysseus in general. Now, what did the name Odysseus mean? What does that translate to? Anybody recall? Trouble. Trouble. Odysseus is trouble. He's trouble for others. Right, in that his counsels, his stratagems, have ruined other people's lives. And he is himself also followed by trouble. in part because some very powerful gods hate him. So he is, over the course of this epic, both victim and victimizer. Um, there's another translation um, of Odysseus of the name that translates to something like um, the man who's every hand, uh, the man who, whom every hand is against. He's everyone's enemy. Yeah, Ty. Um, I was thinking about the part where um, it was saying that Poseidonus might have been a ship, like, even though, like, I don't know, I was wondering why you say that. Okay, can you point us to it? I think that it should, like, be able to say that the Poseidonus might be a Venetian ship as it sailed back home over the misty sea. Okay. Right, oh, and before that, right, my father, Nausithous, say how Poseidon was angry with us because we always gave safe passage to men. He said that one day Poseidon would smite a Phaeacian ship as it sailed back home over the misty sea. Um, okay, so what's Poseidon the god of? Yeah, he's the god of the sea. So, what sorts of things does Poseidon like to do? He likes to mess with sailors, yeah. Because, yeah, because, yeah, because sailing is a sort of sin against the sea, right? You're mocking the power of the sea. It's like, I can cross over your surface as though it was land, right? I dare you to capsize my ship. So, and Poseidon's response is, oh, yeah? All right. Hurricane. Enjoy your shipwreck, yeah. 
But yeah, yeah, a, a lot, for, for a lot of early societies, right, um, you know, there, there's this, you know, the sense, you know, of, for example, farming as a sin against the earth god or earth goddess, right? Sailing as a sin against the sea god, fishing as a sin against the sea god. Um, and so you have to propitiate that particular god in order to continue with your activity. I mean, we still see remnants of this belief uh, in sailor superstitions, right? You know, there are you know, certain times of day when they won't, when, you know, when you won't sail or, you know, certain things you're not supposed to take aboard a ship, um, things of that nature, because doing so would pro the origins of those beliefs are the ideas that sort of doing so would provoke the gods. All right, so we're about out of time. Um, I did not remember to bring my flash drive, so I don't have the reading questions for you, but I'll email them to you this afternoon. All right, so we'll see you on Wednesday. Finish up with the eyes.